Hi, I'm Ross, and tonight we're in John 8. Um, when I first studied the book of John in a systematic way with a group of guys, I came away saying this. You know, it's John is where I discovered I met the person of Jesus. Now, what I meant by that was, is all of a sudden, Jesus was a person distinct from God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. Thus, I expected in this year, John should be all about Jesus giving people wonderful information about himself or the Father or the Spirit. But when we come to John 8 and, and much of the rest of John and maybe a lot of the rest of the Bible, we're not walking in on a church service. We're walking in on an on acrimonious conflict with just a brief, few brief holy moments. When humans argue, a saying often comes up, oh, that interaction generated more heat than light. When Jesus interacts with us, it's pure light. Any heat we suffer is on us. I feel Now I feel like I need to apologize for having you walk into the midst of an ongoing conflict. But for some reason, it's where Jesus shines out his light and truth. In verse 1 of John 8, Jesus was on the Mount of Olives before dawn. Mount of Olives is a hill near Jerusalem, and on it, president's got some, at present, it's got some residences, some agricultural land, some views of Judea, and a road leading down to Jerusalem. Back in the day, it's where Jesus would go to get prayed up. So let's get prayed up now. <clears throat> Jesus, on earth, you did your father's business in, a, in the midst of an uproar. Now, Give us each of us, each of us, what we need today uh, as we look together for these next 30 minutes into your word and how you shine in light into a conflict that characterizes much of John 8. Let's hear a clear truth, even in the confusing din, and for the brief moments where the din is stilled, let us be in awe of your love and patience for your own. In Jesus' name we pray. All right, let's see, where am I here? Um, all right, so we're going to start with Jesus' encounter with religious leaders and with the sinning woman. And we'll look at how Jesus is going to bring truth, no matter what, to both sides of the conflict. Then we'll go into the division that's head headlines with, I am the light of the world. And then we'll end with the division that headlines with, the truth will set you free. Some themes to listen for, light versus darkness, truth versus lies, freedom versus slavery. Spoiler alert here. Humans have seemed to lost, seem to have lost their ability to even tell that they're uh, in this darkness uh, or in this pack of lives or even in slavery. We just don't seem to have any sensation that uh, we're there and we we ought to want to get out. <clears throat> um, so given that, here's a question that's gonna, that comes to mind. How's Jesus going to deal with people that are in a bad place, but don't really have any inclination to get out? Verses 1 through 11 is the story of religious leaders hauling in a woman caught in adultery. Obviously a setup. In your discussion, you likely heard both some technical details and some transformational truths. I love the details, but I want to talk about a transformational truth found here. As I read this story, my mind went to two verses, John 3.16, which summarizes the gospel, and John 3.17, which summarizes Jesus' mission. We'll never tire of hearing John 3.16 for God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son that whoever believes shall not perish, but have eternal life. And we'll never tire of singing it either. My not yet three-year-old granddaughter sings this truth. And I'd be fine if those were the last words I hear on my way out of this world. Jesus loves me, he who died, heaven's gate to open wide. He will wash away my sin. Let his little child come in. Let's think a little bit more about hell avoidance and heaven admittance. 
also known as salvation. Now, hang on. The tide of John 8 is coming. So I recall a Christian movie I watched. The evangelist was giving the gospel message in the cowboy chapel. I was struck that he thought he needed to stop in his message to explain sin. He said something like this. Lying is a sin. Stealing is a sin. Looking at a woman lustfully is a sin. His audience was mostly men, so he need not go any farther than that. I kind of get it that those rough bunch of cowboys needed the sin explanation. But certainly the never miss church types shouldn't have needed it. I'm in that demographic of folks who's found every week in church. And yet, along with those first century religious leaders, I can lose my sensitivity to some very basic sin for decades at a time. I need to hear that list of sins again, and with the Holy Spirit mercifully opening my eyes. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us what Jesus wrote on the ground with his finger. <clears throat> But we'll see, they were in the temple. It's paved with flat stones. In fact, the temple floor still stands, although it's got a mosque built on it. On Sinai, 15 centuries earlier, God wrote out the law on a flat stone with his finger. He wrote, lying is a sin. Stealing is a sin. Looking at a woman lustfully is a sin. Well, the woman's accusers were men. Jesus wouldn't have needed to go any further. You know the rest of the story. The woman heard two things. First, she heard, then neither do I condemn you. My mind races back to John 3.17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. This confirms to me that Jesus came in peace not condemnation, no such promise for a second coming. But for the present, Jesus is approachable. When he repeatedly says, don't be afraid, he means it. And when he says in chapter seven, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He meant anyone, he meant come. Jesus is approachable. Second, the woman heard, go now and leave your life of sin. Now, that's not so much different from what he told the paralyzed guy that he saved back in chapter 5. He said, stop sinning or something worse will happen to you. And quick add, Jesus' tender mercy to the adulteress is readily evident. But for those of us who put ourselves in the story with the accusers, Jesus mercifully enables folks like me, folks like that, to see our sin and cool down before something worse happens. I have had that mercy extended to me. I want to be careful not to add a thing to John 3.16. Whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Let me repeat. Whoever believes followed up with, I'm here to save, not condemn. That is good news. While I don't want to add a thing to whoever believes, I don't want to delete anything from leave your life of sin. That's a command. And Jesus only commands the possible. It might sound impossible when he says stuff like, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father's perfect. We dreamed of a phrase to come to our ready defense. Nobody's perfect. In other words, this common phrase says that perfection is beyond us. So don't expect much. But of course, it's false because Jesus is perfect. Adam was perfect before the fall. And anyone while under the Spirit's control has a perfect love for their Heavenly Father. The truth is, is that God took what was beyond us and placed it within us. It's far more popular to treat the life we're commanded to, to live, as a suggested direction that we're not actually capable of doing for lack of something. Now, people wrongly hear, we're going to sin, 
as we're not giving the equipment to obey. This is wrong thinking that provides me with a permanent excuse for my willful disobedience. The truth is, is that what we need to obey is available. Now, the opposite of willful disobedience is God-pleasing, uncoerced obedience. But how? The truth is, is that God took what was beyond us and placed it within us. Now, if that's too poetic for you, let me quote Oswald Chambers. He's describing a moment when we want God's will and all of the compulsion to do right is gone. We just want God's will. Remember the question we wish answered is, but how? Chambers says, when we choose to deliberately obey him, then he will tax the remotest star in the last grain of sand to assist us with his almighty power. Now that's hundred year old language. Let me say it my way. Oh, you've chosen to get serious about obeying? Then for anyone choosing to obey, God will break out his infinite resources to make sure the obedience happens. We're used to hearing the exaggeration that someone will go to the ends of the earth. God is ready and able to go to the edge of the universe, and he wouldn't be exaggerating. Now that said, we got to get rid of this lurking idea that we can get right to God, get right with God via our obedience. Only the death of Jesus can get us right with God. He will wash away my sin. Let his little child come in. Verse 11 contains both, I don't condemn you, and leave your sin. The order, the order is radical. First forgiveness, and then a command to leave sin. What we all expect is, hey, if you leave your sin, I'll forgive you. Because we expect this, it emboldens our accuser, Satan, to tell us, see, told you so. You thought you were saved, but you sinned again. Jesus is now unapproachable for you. The truth is, is that Jesus is approachable. And whoever believes has eternal life. And once that's been permanently established, now go, leave your life of sin. The principle here is, Jesus is not soft on sin. He's big on salvation. Jesus is not soft on sin. He's big on salvation. What words of Jesus can you continually run through your mind assuring you that Jesus provides salvation to sinners? And that includes sin againers. I have a hard time throwing away stuff. I tell my kids that just don't tell me if you throw any of my junk away. <clears throat> And I trust their assessment. What might Jesus do for you if you let him name the sin and carry that seeming precious thing out to the curb? Sorry, guys. It, the first 11 verses took half the available time. But I needed to preach that to myself. And now I did. Thanks for your patience. The next section leads off with the second I am statement in John. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Light is a connecting theme in the Bible, and it's really important. Now, my coverage of it won't be comprehensive, but you've already explored it in this week's question six. A couple of words I noticed there were light and follow. It's the Christmas season. So you may be thinking about the Magi following the star. But I'm thinking of Exodus 13. Now remember, the last day of the festival of Sukkot just occurred at the end of chapter 7. And now we're in chapter 8 of John. Okay? Now I'm going to read Exodus 13. <clears throat> Verse 20. After leaving the town of Sukkot, they camped at Etham on the edge of the desert. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way. And by night, a pillar of fire to give them light so they could travel by day or night. Neither the 
pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front leading of the people. <clears throat> now, in their time in the desert, the Israelites lived in tents. The Feast of Sukkot, or booths, remembers that time. During, the, during that 40 years, the light, the flaming pillar within the cloud led them. And Exodus 40 calls that the cloud of the Lord. So it says that cloud, that's the cloud of the Lord that's leading us. All right. So this is my opinion, that when Jesus showed up and said, I'm the light of the world, he was saying, I'm the pillar of fire that the world is to follow. Following me means you'll never be in the dark. And it results in life. Earlier, I hinted that humans are just not very good at noticing lies, darkness, and slavery. Thus, if offered truth and light and freedom, they might argue that they got plenty of that and tell you to get off their front porch. But some respond. And our section ends with the holy moment in verse 30. Even as he spoke, many put their faith in him. Does that verse make your heart thrill? If so, you have a hope of a life spent with Jesus. Now, I like the following lyrics. They start with Jesus, the light of the world. And sure, that light allows us to notice that we're in a morass of lies, darkness, and slavery. But wait, the best and highest reason to have your eyes opened is to see the beauty of Jesus' person and have the new hope of a life spent with him. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes and let me see beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. Opening our eyes lets us see the light and the truth and freedom available. Choosing it is choosing a life spent with Jesus. It's necessary to see the light of the world, but it's choosing the light of the world that marks our homecoming. And the principle is, the light of the world still opens eyes. If you were to ask God, what might he do to cause an old or new acquaintance to ask you about the hope that you have? I was under the impression that Jesus was pretty mysterious or elusive about who he was until I worked on question nine in the lesson. That question points to Jesus' answer to the religious leader's question. Who are you? Jesus answered, just what I've been claiming all along. So I worked backward, page or two, to see what it was that Jesus was claiming. Here's what I was quickly able to find. The Son of the Father, the light of the world, sent by the Father, from above, a valid witness, the one to believe in, the Son of God, accompanied by his Father, obedient to his Father, written about by Moses, offerer of living water, going to a place that you're not, healer, miracle, bread of heaven, which is the first I am statement in John. Oh, I guess he was extremely clear about his divine nature. His detractors were in the dark. In verse 31, we see Jesus turn his words to those who believed in him. And that leads our third division that runs to the end of chapter 8. Let me read it. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, it's self-evident that a real disciple would practice his teacher's teaching. Later in John, Jesus will command his disciples to do more than just practice teachings. He would ask them to abide in him. You know, like move in and pitch your tent right on his campsite. Occasionally, an older academic building will carry the inscription, the truth will set you free, often written in Latin. Now, being educated does help in attaining freedom, but it's not enough. Jesus is the embodiment of truth, 
And thus, it's truth, the person, that sets us free. Simply information or even a system of religious beliefs won't set us free. It takes a person. It takes a person who is divine. And Jesus makes that crystal clear that it's a person setting you free in verse 36. So if the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. Now we need to address what sort of freedom is free indeed. Now it's got to be a freedom that exists outside of a person's circumstance. In other words, it has to be available to both slave and free. I previously stated that um, Jesus is not soft on sin. He's big on salvation. And once he's addressed salvation, then via the Holy Spirit, he gets to work on freeing us from the tyranny of our addictions and the other of the devil's schemes. And you will be happier if you ask him to get at that right away than delay. Now, if you ever want to kill me, all you need to do is lock me in a room with bushels of Halloween or Easter candy. Well, I'll tell you, hey, I can stop at any time. I won't ever stop. And I'll eat myself into a sugar coma. If candy didn't cost money, I'd be dead. The fact is, is that our addiction to the sins we consider precious is killing us. And we can't stop on our own. Jesus intends to set us free indeed. That's what he means to do. He's out to set us free. Now let's make that our principle. Jesus is able to set us free indeed. Not only is he able, but he wants freedom for us. Now trusting him to bring freedom, now that takes some courage. David had that courage. Now, what was it that David believed about God that gave him the courage to ask this of God in Psalm 139, which says, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. How about me? Do I dare pray that search me prayer? What would I have to believe is true about God to give me such confidence? Let me finish by going back to who Jesus is. Matthew emphasizes Jesus' humanity. John emphasizes Jesus' divinity. Intellectually, I get that. He's both fully God and fully man. But I can't seem to handle both in my head at the same time. In verse 25, the religious leaders asked, who are you? I'm guessing they were puzzled and frustrated, but they were certainly unbelieving. Now in verse 53, this time they get really abusive and exclaim, who do you think you are? That amps up the discussion of Father Abraham. And Jesus states, before Abraham was born, I was. That throws those unbelieving leaders into a murderous rage, which is a stark contrast to how Abraham received the Lord, Yahweh, in Genesis 18. But how I react to those words, before Abraham was born, I am is awe. All of a sudden, this Jesus who I casually read and study puts a claim on my life because of who he is, my creator, my savior, the rightful king. Pray with me. Jesus, you are my creator and savior. Father in heaven, draw me to Jesus such that I promptly and sincerely make Jesus the king of my life. Jesus, you were born to set your people free, free from our fears and sins. Let us find our rest in thee. You are our hope and consolation, hope of all the earth, dear desire of every nation, and joy of every longing heart. Cause us to experience freedom, the release, the rest, the hope, the desire for you alone, and the joy of your presence. In Jesus' name, amen.